afternoon, everybody. You're very welcome to the Geary Institute for Public Policy uh, seminar today. Today, I'm uh, delighted to introduce Dr. Uh, Robbie Butler from University College Cork. Robbie has been a lecturer in economics in Cork since uh, 2006. Uh, his research has been published in leading international journals. Since November 2017, Robbie has been the director of the Centre for Sports, Economics and Law. Uh, his research is focused on institutional economics and sports economics. And you can view some of his other work on sportseconomics.org. So today, Robbie's going to present work in progress, which is informal constraints in an institutional setting, the evolution of the football jersey. And before Robbie begins, can I remind everybody again that we will use, uh, we will take questions through the Q&A format, which uh, um, we will address um, at the end of Robbie's seminar. So without further ado, over to you, Robbie. Thanks very much for that introduction. Um, and thanks for the opportunity uh, to speak. It was an honor to be asked to do this. I'm, I'm delighted to be able to do it. So I want to talk to you today about um, the football jersey uh, and the evolution of the football jersey uh, through time. Um, and to bring together, I suppose, my PhD training, which was in institutional economics and most of my research over the past decade, which has been in sports economics. Um, when I talk to you today about football, I'm talking about association football. Um, so North America and Ireland actually are two of uh, very few places that when we say football, we might mean something different. So if, if you're in Kerry, for example, and you say football, it often means something different to the people living in other parts of Ireland or certainly in, in Europe. And it obviously means something different in, in, in North America as well. So we're talking about soccer here. Um, so. Where I started when I, I can tell you how I got the idea to, to do this paper. Um, I had an interaction a number of years ago with a friend of mine who bought me a football jersey for um, a newborn baby. And it was six to nine months. And by the time the, uh, the baby was old enough to, to get into the, the, the outfit, uh, it had already become outdated. Um, and I remember thinking to myself, you know, when I was a child, if somebody had bought me a jersey, it wouldn't have um, become outdated that quickly. And I just began to think about it and God, you know, the pace of change of the football jersey has really sped up. Um, and I then had a more recent interaction with that same baby who is not a baby anymore, who hopefully you won't see during the course of this, but uh, I can't rule that out who came to me about six months ago looking for um, the new Liverpool jersey. And when I replied to say, well, you already have it, he said, yeah, but it's not the new one. And again, I thought, you know, when I was a child, that was never the case. So Douglas North, who's um, the famous institutional economist, won the Nobel Prize, uh, the only institutional economist to, to win the Nobel Prize, argued that institutions were the rules of the game that, to define the way the game is played, but the objective of the team within the set of rules is to win the game. Now, when North wrote that in 1990, he wasn't making any reference to sport. He just used the sporting metaphor to describe what an institution was. Um, and I thought about it. I said, well, football then is a great example of an institution because it relies upon codified formal rules. These have existed for 150 years at this stage, um, and they became universal in 1863. Now, any sport, you don't have to talk about football here, relies on a codified set of formal rules. So sport itself is a great example of an institution. And within this, there exists a set of very complex informal constraints. Um, and these are also institutions. They're just of a different type. Um, and I want to try and bring these two together today. Um, so just to give you an overview of what I'm going to do, <clears throat> there's 22 slides, just so you know, we're on slide three, uh, just in case anybody struggles, or stay with it. I often used to find that, particularly when I was a student, it's nice to know where the end was. I'm going to give you a quick overview of the football jersey, talk to you about some informal and formal institutions, then speak to you about the evolution of the jersey, why it's evolved the way it has, um, and then kind of try and explain what we think has happened by looking at colour, identity and, and branding, and then just finish up. Um, just a couple of sides. I think it, it's um, nice that I guess that we're doing this here in Ireland because Ireland has a quite unique uh, uh, relationship with the football jersey because Ireland was the first international team to ever put a jersey sponsor on our jersey. We did it in 1986. People might remember it wasn't three, it was Opal. Uh, and Opal became synonymous then with the Irish football team for various reasons connected to places like uh, Stuttgart and Italy and, uh, and America. Um, 
there's also an interesting dynamic if you want to look at the GAA. This this um, this presentation is not about the GAA, but sponsorship in the GAA was banned until 1991, um, and it was. Uh, at a Congress in April 1991, the two momentous decisions were made. One was to redevelop Croke Park, and the second was to remove the ban on advertising. And less than uh, a day later, um, a Galway schools team took to the field to play in Croke Park with Galway oil uh, sewn onto the, the jersey. Um, it wouldn't happen in inter-county football for a number of days later, but you might recall the, the battle between Meads and Dublin in the early 1990s. That's when um, sponsorship made its way onto, onto the GA pitch and uh, what's happened since. But just to return to football, and again, just to give you a quick overview of, of the football jersey. So we can trace this codified set of rules um, back to 1857. The rules that exist today are, um, are based on what were known as the Sheffield rules, um, uh, originating from the, the city of Sheffield. Interesting, they weren't the first set of rules that were ever written. The first set of rules were codified in Cambridge, but they never uh, gained customary status. And because they didn't become custom, they never became enforceable the way the Sheffield rules did. And it was about six years later that these rules then were fully codified. And they are the rules that are essentially governed football today. Uh, they can be traced all the way back to the, the 1860s. And one of the things that was outlined in the, in the Sheffield rules was that each player must provide himself with a red and dark blue flannel cap one colour to be worn by each side. So there was a, an understanding and um, a realisation that identification on a football pitch was critical in order to know which team one was playing on. So what you can see here are, are six jerseys uh, and they're from, you can see the source at the bottom, historical football, or sorry, historical kits. And the, the source of this data comes from this website. It's a, it's a brilliant website for anyone who wants to go and look at it because it traces jerseys uh, through time for... Uh, many, many football clubs and international teams. And the reason there's six there is because there's only six teams that have never been relegated from the Premier League. Um, and if if we were in a normal face-to-face -face mode here, I'd often ask people, well, you know, which teams are, are which? Um, and uh, one or two are often identified. So the, the top left, the red, is Arsenal. So Arsenal have always worn red. Uh, and of the, the six teams that have never been relegated from the Premier League, they're the only one that, that can say that. Uh, interestingly, the bottom left is actually Liverpool. And Liverpool launched this jersey about 10 years ago. It was an away jersey. And um, many people questioned the use of blue because they said, well, Liverpool had never worn blue. Well, actually, the very first jersey was a uh, blue and white half. And the other one that's quite recognisable beside that, um, it was Newton Heath, which became Manchester United. But about 100 years later, Manchester United had a commemorative uh, jersey um, that they wore during the Alex Ferguson years, and many famous Irish players would have worn this jersey for Manchester United. And again, that is the roots of, of that jersey. But you can see um, the, the green was Chelsea, the uh, the blue and white stripe uh, was Everton, and uh, the the navy with the, the the red crest, the H that stood for Hotspur, was Tottenham Hotspur. Um, but what you can see is that, with the exception of Arsenal, these clubs have worn different colours, um, and we wanted to try and understand that. So. We started to look at the idea of formal and informal institutions. So from the point of view of football, well, the formal institution is the rule that you have to wear uh, what was a cap originally, but now a jersey. But the informal institution then is kind of things that govern the behaviour of agents, like codes, like custom, like habit, like norms, uh, like traditions. Um, and these are not necessarily codified. They're not enforceable legally the way formal institutions are. Um, so we started to delve into this literature. Now, I can tell you that this literature is um, highly diverse and it is contested. Um, so you have to sort of read a lot of it to try and understand uh, what these often conflicting terms mean. So we've lent on a number of different academics in the area uh, to try and understand. And like I said, um, there is ongoing debate as to what constitutes a rule, what constitutes a norm, and academics often disagree um, because there's no consensus as to what each of these things are. But for the purposes of, of our work, we, we, um, we're happy to assume that rules can include norms of behavior and social conventions, as well as legal or formal rules. So a rule can be both formal and informal. Right? A norm then requires consent, um, whereas rules do not. Um, so they differ, therefore, by the means in which they impose tasks on people. So if, if you think of coming to um, a traffic light, if the traffic light is red, well, that's a rule. 
um, you don't need, it doesn't require consent, you have to stop. Whereas a norm, that's something that does require consent. So in order for it to become normative behavior, people have to accept that that is the way it is. Um, a custom then is critical for a rule to become a law. And we can think of the original Cambridge rules that were adopted in uh, the 1840s. Um, they never became customary. And because they didn't become customary, the rules were never uh, written down and codified and sort of became the legal foundation for football. Whereas the Sheffield rules did become customary. And because the Sheffield rules became customary, people used these rules. So they sort of gained a form of moral authority by using these uh, customary rules. And then finally, just to say what a habit is, well, the habit then uh, is the propensity to replicate the same action under sim similar material circumstances. Now the habit has to be uh, in an agent. So a football club can't have a habit. Uh, the, the habit or the habitual behavior is very much the action of the agent, the person, the player, the manager, the coach. Okay. So we wanted to try and look at football and say, well, what are the formal and inst formal institutions in football? Well, the formal ones are fairly easy to identify. So um, they are now governed by IFAB. IFAB are the International Football Association Board. So IFAB are the, the rule makers. Um, so the seven members, three are from FIFA. And the other four members are from the whole nations of England, Wales, Scotland, and Northern Ireland. Uh, Ireland actually had membership on IFAB prior to 1921, um, but following independence, um, we gave up our, our place on, on IFAB. Um, the, uh, it, it's not a case of majority. Um, the three FIFA members um, are required to vote in favour of rule changes. So FIFA are very much... Um, the, the cornerstone of rule changes happening. It can't be a case the home nations just gang up on, on FIFA. But just to give you an example of a, of a formal institution is a goalkeeper. So um, Irish international Emma Byrne who played for Arsenal for nearly two decades and for 140 caps for Ireland. There's a great example of a formal institution. You have to play with a goalkeeper. So you cannot take to the field of play without a goalkeeper. Um, and if you do, the game can't start because you're breaking this formal institution. But inside these formal rules, and there are many of them, if you read the laws of the game, you have informal institutions. So probably the most obvious one that we see regularly is when a player is injured, the ball is often kicked from the field of play. Um, so there's no rule, there's no formal rule that says you need to do this. But if you watch football and you see a player get injured and you see a team continuing to play, you can often hear whistling from a crowd when we have... Uh, people in attendance, or you can see the opposition players remonstrating to say, you know, kick the ball out of play. Um, so it's kind of accepted as the thing you should do. And you even have more extreme examples. So one of the, the most extreme happened in 2015, uh, Paul Dickoff, a former Manchester City player who became manager of uh, Doncaster Rovers. He was managing in a game against Bury. A, um, a Doncaster Rovers player got injured, uh, Burry kicked the ball out of play, and in the process of returning the ball, his team accidentally scored. The ball was kicked back to the Burry goalkeeper. It bounced over the goalkeeper's head and went into the goal. Um, now, by the, the formal rules, that is a goal, so it was 1-0 to Doncaster, but the manager of Doncaster uh, was not happy with this. He didn't feel it was in the spirit of the game, and he ordered his players to allow Burry to score uh, an equalising goal so that the game became 1-1. So again, a really nice example of a, of, of a custom, um, of an, an approved norm that is not captured by the laws of the game, but does exist within the game. And then if you bring these together, you can land at the football jersey where I want to turn now. So <clears throat> this is an original football jersey of a Premier League, uh, of a Premier League club. And again, if we're under normal circumstances, you ask people, you know, who is this the original jersey of? Uh, it was black and white. There's a Maltese cross. The Maltese cross was actually something that was very common in football jerseys in the, in the 19th century. Um, often the origins of these jerseys came from the public schooling of the players that, that played on the teams. Um, that was the very first jersey of Manchester City. So you can see there's quite a dramatic evolution from what we see back in the 1800s to, um, to, what, we see, um, to what we see today. Um, so let me talk to you about the evolution of the football jersey. So we've broken this into kind of five phases. The first starts in 1863. The reason we start in 1863 is because Stoke City uh, are now the oldest Lee uh, football league club. It was Notts County, um, but they were founded in 1863. Um, 
And what you will find is if, if you go from 1863 all the way up to 1891, which becomes very, very important from an institutional perspective, clubs are changing their jerseys all the time. Uh, they change from match to match in some cases, definitely from season to season. So Manchester United wore three or four colours before they rested on red. Liverpool were the same. Tottenham wore various colours before resting on white. Newcastle, I think, had nine colours before resting on, on black and white stripes. But the first team to actually decide on a fixed colour, uh, not in the Premier League uh, at the moment, but a very famous English team were Nottingham Forest. And in 1868, Nottingham Forest decided that they were going to wear red. Uh, for the three seasons prior to this, they wore white. The reason they wore white is that the players played county cricket. Um, and because the football club didn't have any jerseys, they just wore the, the cricket jerseys. And they would play against their rivals in Ath County. And in order to distinguish them, they wear a red cap. But in 1868, Nottingham Forest decided that they were going to wear, um, they were going to wear red, um, and and they've never changed. Um, so there was a meeting at a at a hotel in 1865, and it was agreed that red would be the colour because of the influence of um, Giuseppe Garibaldi. Uh, Garibaldi, who would come from Italy, had done a tour of of northern England, the industrial heartland, and he had been quite popular. And red was the colour that was associated with him. Um, so the, the decision was made by the club at the time that red were to become the official colours. So in 1891, then we get a, a very uh, important moment in the, in the evolution of the football jersey because we have an AGM. And at the AGM, there's a proposal about uh, team colours. And the reason there's a proposal is a number of months earlier, um, uh, Sunderland had played Wolves uh, and Wolverhampton had made uh, the, the, the quite... Um, the extensive trip at the time northwards to Sunderland and when they arrived uh, they realized that their red and white jerseys were identical to Sunderland's red and white jerseys. Um, nobody had, had realized this, nobody had foreseen this, so the game couldn't go ahead. Um, and as a consequence then two things uh, changed. The one was the idea that a second strip would be required, the second strip was to be all white, and the second was this idea that club colors could be registered so there's a wonderful extract from the Burnley Express all, all the way back in 1891. This is a direct ex, ex, extract, and it, it identifies the colours that the teams were wearing at the time. If I just draw your attention to the second paragraph there, it speaks uh, about the colours that clubs are wearing. And you can see Everton were wearing ruby with blue trimmings, Bolton were blue, West Brom, and navy and white stripes, which they continue to be today. Uh, Wolverhampton were blue and orange. Uh, Knots were thinking of changing. Um, and Burnley made an application to be allowed to use it, but the former, upon reconsideration, then decided to stick. So one club was literally waiting to see what the other club would wear, um, and Stoke and Darwin were waiting to see what colour Burnley would choose. So you're starting to see the development of sort of very early traditions or customs are starting to come into place. And in 1892, then, they made the decision, well, you know what, if, if, if we're going to allow a second strip, well, then... Clubs can actually register the same set of colours. And if they happen to play each other, they just wear the second strip. Um, and from this, we really get the, uh, I guess, from this formal institution, we really get this custom of club colours, a habit of wearing um, colours um, that's now pervaded for more than a century. Because to begin with, um, there was no strategic reason to wear a particular set of colours. There is today, which I'll talk to you about, there's very strategic reasons to, to stick with the colours you have. Back in 1890 or 1891, it was purely a, a decision of the, the agents involved, what they were motivated by, who inspired them. So we start to see the emergence then of norms and customs. And here you can see the adoption of club colours through time. So we have the 92 football league clubs from uh, the 2018-19 season. And you can see that the explosion tends to happen just after this um, AGM. So right after the AGM, over the next 10 years, we have 21 clubs adopting permanent colours. The 16 to 10 years after that and 12 just after that. And then it gradually slows down. You reach a sort of inflection point. Now, it's, it's not correct to say that clubs haven't changed colours. Yeah, they absolutely have. And we have some uh, significant examples of this. So um, there's some notable examples of, of clubs that have changed colours post-World War II um, for various different reasons, commercial reasons. Leeds United, supposedly, because they were so inspired by the famous Real Madrid teams of the 1950s and 1960s, changed to all white. Uh, in more recent times, Luton Town, the most recent Forest Green, 
uh, who had never wore green, but maybe now appropriately do wear green. Um, but many other clubs as well ha ha have um, have changed um, colours like Crystal Palace and Watford, Axfield, uh, Oxford since. But generally speaking, it's something that was decided upon uh, prior to, to World War II. Um, and then we kind of um, outlined three later phases. So the third phase uh, after the kind of the, the, the AGM decision brings us post World War II, where we sort of see this resilience because um, football was stopped for seven years uh, during World War II. It stopped in 1939. It didn't restart again until 1946. So there was no reason why clubs couldn't change colors or pick a different color or decide to wear something else. There was, um, no commercialization of the jersey at this point. But we see huge resilience because only two clubs actually change colours following resumption of the football calendar in August 1946. And there's a really nice story from um, um, oh, um, the club escaped now. It is Oldham Athletic, apologies. Remember Oldham Athletic. So Oldham Athletic are wearing blue. They've worn blue for 30 years. Uh, the war hits in 1939, so they had worn a jersey 1935, 1936 season, which is blue and white. And in 1946, they take the field of play in red and white hoops. Now, they had worn red and high, white hoops at the very start, but had quickly changed to blue and white. And the reason they wore red and white was because the rugby league team wore red and white and blue and white wasn't available. But the moment blue and white became available again, they immediately switched back. To, uh, to blue and white. And then later on during the 1960s and into 1970s, it was a takeover of the club. Uh, Ken Bates went on to, to own Chelsea, decided to, to take over the club and change the strip to, to orange. But again, um, it didn't last for a variety of reasons, opposition mainly. And the club returned to, to blue again um, and have re remained in blue ever since. We identify a fourth phase then, what we call commercialization was a seismic moment on the 24th of January 1976. A uh, little known Kettering Town took to the field of play with the word Kettering Tires on their jersey. Uh, it was the first time a sponsor had ever appeared on any jersey uh, in football. Uh, they were immediately told to remove it uh, under um, punishment of a £5,000 fine, so they did remove it, but um, a motion had been set in place. And the following year, Hibernian in Scotland became the first British club to put uh, jersey sponsored on the jersey and they were quickly followed by Liverpool and then Everton and by 1982 uh, every team in, um, in the Football League had a sponsor on their jersey and what you start to see then in this fourth phase is the rise of broadcasting and broadcasting revenue becomes so important um, and that then continues throughout the late 1980s and into the 1990s which brings us to the final phase which is the Premier League era which I'm sure many people will be familiar with and we are now at effectively saturation point with the jerseys. So uh, this season, Everton um, are the only Premier League club that they have four jerseys. Uh, so they've been doing this for quite some time, Everton, um, uh, producing four jerseys. Now, while the focus of our research is on, on the home jersey on the left, the blue, um, you can see there's various different shades of jersey uh, that they produce. Uh, other clubs do have four jerseys. You take Manchester City, they do have four trips this season. One is a special edition. That's something we've seen uh, happen on more than one occasion where there's sort of a commemorative strip. And if you want to take Manchester United, they will use a, a different jersey in European football than they do in uh, in domestic football. So we've effectively reached a situation where clubs have three, possibly four jerseys. And these are changing season after season after season. Um, you have to go back to around 2000 and nine, 10 season to find a Premier League club that uses the same home jersey um, one season after the next. There's a lovely extract from, from Robinson and Clegg who say it's become an occupational hazard for Premier League fans that when they buy a shirt with a player's name on the back, um, the £70 garment, what they just splashed out for, uh, now has a shorter shelf life than the latest iPhone. The kit designs change every year uh, in perpetual, so ever so slightly rebranding re of the same basic colour scheme and format and this was the root of my problem so I had a Liverpool jersey that was five or six months old with a player's name on the back and I be, was being asked to buy uh, the new jersey and, and no doubt in a number of months time 
there will be another new jersey um, and i'll be asked to, to to buy that as well so this is the reality that are facing fans uh growing up as a child in ireland this was not a reality you could have a jersey that might last two three even four seasons um and be and be the jersey that uh the team actually wore on the field of play so we try to explain this process and to try and understand well what's actually ha happening here so um resilience of club colors because it is really important to 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 identify that to say that the jerseys on the left hand side here the blue of everton the sky blue of man city the but the red of Manchester United, these are absolutely unchanging. And in all three cases, they're over 100 years old. So there's a remarkable resilience to that colour. And it is now unthinkable that Manchester United would take to the field of play at home in anything but red. Um, it, it, it simply would not happen. So the resilience of the colour, we believe, can be explained in the context of, of three very important features. Um, the informal constraints, which I spoke to you about, the, the custom, the approved norm, the, the habit or the habitual behavior that the agents now engage in, that is absolutely the, the origins of this. But today, this is now intertwined with two other aspects of identity and goodwill, um, uh, which are very important, particularly from the commercial side of the game. So there's been a harnessing of the informal constraint with the... Um, revenue maximizing model that many clubs now um, or all clubs now pursue so law 4.3 of the game is the actual formal constraint it's the law that explains that the, the teams have to take to the field of play in distinguishing colors now nobody could have anticipated 120 or 130 years ago um, that this formal rule would lead to the mass commercialization of the jersey that we see today um, but it has acted, first of all, as the catalyst for the custom and the approved norm. Um, Gray Beale points out that habitual behaviour occurs continuously. We do it all, our, all the time in all our lives. Uh, in some cases, it can occur over many years and it can become extraordinarily fixed. And that's what we are certainly seeing with the traditional colours that are being worn by, um, by these teams. Um, as most English football league clubs change jerseys many times, the decision to wear the now traditional colours were not automatic, but rather deliberate. And this is another very uh, important point. Um, the agents gradually and automatically built up a cognitive association between their experiences of playing the game and the wearing of the colours. So we have cue action behaviour here. So I, um, I've read some nice examples of this. So you think of a, a person going to the cinema and the first time they go to the cinema, they might just go to the cinema, pay for the ticket and go and watch the movie. Whereas the second time they go to the cinema, they might go and, and buy popcorn um, and go and watch the movie. The third time they again return to the cinema, they buy popcorn again and watch the movie. So the queue is going to the cinema and the action is buying of the popcorn. Now, it wasn't automatic. Right? It didn't automatically happen. It, it took time but it became habitual. And the same is true of, of, of the colours that were worn. The first 10, 15, 20 years of these clubs, there was no strategic reason to wear a certain set of colours. As I said, they changed sporadically. But at some point in time, a decision was made to, to, to select a set of colours that then didn't change. Um, so the tradition then emerges, the tradition becomes customary, it becomes approved by the stakeholders, originally the management and the players, but then as, as the clubs became more famous, um, the fans and the fan base and, and, and fan perception into this is very, very important um, because the fan element has led to an identity. Now you can look at Ackerloff and Cranton's seminal work on identity and the importance of identity to behaviour because identification within a social group is exactly what being a football supporter often is. Um, it's often considered tribal. Um, and it's, it's a social group where one might know very few members. So if, if you go to a stadium, if you go to the Aviva, if you go to Croke Park or any stadium internationally, you, you sit there with people that you largely don't know, but you're all cheering for the same outcome or you're all wanting the same outcome. Um, so it's entirely possible that this is the scenario that faces most football fans. So the colour that the club wears now is, is more than just a colour, it's a form of an identity. And there's, there's a really nice example from Cardiff City to illustrate this. So back in 
um, 2010, Cardiff City were bought by Malaysian businessman Vincent Tan. So he was one of the many international investors that have taken over Premier League and, and football league clubs in England. And what the Premier League has done to, to England is made small provincial towns, uh, in many cases, world famous. So places that are you know, uh, not particularly big or not known for many things have a famous or a world famous football club. So when Vincent Tan arrived in Cardiff City, uh, one of the things he uh, identified as being problematic was the colour the club wore. Now, Cardiff have worn blue since uh, 1908. In fact, they're called the Bluebirds. You see their crest uh, uh, had a, a blue bird on it. Okay? Uh, but Tan decided that he wanted to change this. There was two reasons. One was marketing. Uh, he believed that red was more popular, particularly in East Asia, where he was from, where he wanted to market the club. And the second, that the, the Bluebird wasn't an appropriate crest. It needed to be changed to something that was more um, uh, impressive, like a dragon. So the, the crest was changed and the jersey was changed from, from blue to red. Um, that happened in August 2012. And immediately uh, the supporters revolted. Um, they did not want to be part of this. Many supporters boycotted buying the new jersey. Many supporters continued to wear blue at, at, the, at the ground. Uh, in a form of appeasement, he decided to change the away jersey to blue, but it still wasn't enough because as far as Cardiff City were concerned, their colour was blue, they weren't red. So being, um, being blue meant being a Cardiff supporter. And it was also very important to see that Cardiff had two uh, very strong rivalries. One was with Swansea City, who were white, but the other was with Bristol City, and Bristol City also were red. Um, so the idea that Cardiff would now wear red just didn't sit with the fans. So identification as a Cardiff City supporter is as much about not being red almost as it is about being blue. So in January 2015, uh, this project was finally abandoned and Cardiff City, um, now managed by former Irish manager Mick McCarthy, returned uh, to wearing uh, blue jerseys. And it's likely they will continue to wear blue jerseys. Um, long, long into the future because of the failure of this experiment. The other aspect that's important is the idea of branding and goodwill. And again, uh, seminal work by, by Klein and Laffert. Um, they identified the importance of branding and reputation. And there's no doubt that this is the way football has emerged uh, and evolved, particularly since the 1980s. It's just coincidental that this paper was published in 1981. But since around 1982, 83, when live football went on free to air television, um, the idea that football can be commercialized has, has, has really taken hold. Now, the consequence of this for the consumer, well, you get inertia, you get loyalty, you get increased switching costs. So that's, this is the reason that people are, are loyal to brands. It's the reason that brands build up a sort of get goodwill, because with goodwill, you can get repeat purchase. And repeat purchase is then crucial to sustaining a brand. Um, and if you want to, 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 to switch from this brand, well, you have costs, you have financial, uh, you have temporal, and, and most of all, from the point of view of the football jersey, we saw the Cardiff City, you have psychological costs. And the psychological cost to a group of Cardiff City supporters was, was, too, uh, was too much to carry, that they weren't prepared to buy a jersey that wasn't blue. Um, so Bronnenberg outlines this very nicely uh, from the point of view of, of our research when they say, well, that... The psychological costs include the cognitive ha hassle of changing one's habit and the appeal to habit, again, is, is, is so important. Um, so, so as I said to you, while the original selection of the club colours offered no strategic advantage, so Manchester United's selection of red or Liverpool's selection of red uh, or Arsenal's, there was no strategic advantage in that. There are a number of papers that try and, and maintain wearing red makes you more successful, but... I think um, the causation is 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 not necessarily sorry. The correlation is not necessarily causation, and um, it's certainly not the case today. There is now a strategic advantage for having a certain color and maintaining this color. Um, large economic gains are possible from merchandising this color, uh, from selling it, from selling repeat uh, replica merchandise. Uh, everything that can be associated with this color, be it a mug or a scarf, or a jersey, or or, or a tracksuit ends or something like that. So. Whilst the modern football jersey has essentially gone full circle, and what I mean by that is it's gone from changing every season uh, way back in the 1800s uh, to changing every season again, um, 
the causation for that is very, very different. Um, what we see today is akin to what we saw in the 19th century. The main difference is that the colour doesn't change. So we can know for certainty next season what the Premier League club teams will wear uh, at home. We can almost say for certainty uh, it'll be red, it'll be blue, it'll be white, um, etc. Um, 120, 130 years ago, we didn't know what colour they would wear. We knew it might change. The colour was up for grabs. Uh, so while we conjecture that the pace of change will not increase, it can't, because we effectively have one jersey per season, we've, we've reached a saturation. Uh, the colour will probably never change again, if Cardiff City's experiment is, is anything to go by. But the, the loyal football supporter uh, has to accept that the shelf life is now about um, 10 months. So if you're buying this for um, <clears throat> smaller people or you're buying it for friends or whatever, uh, it's likely you could be asked to buy this um, same jersey with a slightly different cuff or collar or crest or sponsor um, in 10 months' time. But at least you know um, it will certainly be uh, the right colour. So you, you might get a, a longer shelf life out of it than you would if you were able to get these uh, a century ago. Um, if people are interested in reading more about our work, uh, we, we research extensively in this now. So as I mentioned at the start, we have a blog that's regularly updated, sportseconomics.org. We have a center here in UCC that can be visited. We have undergraduate modules. We have a master's by research. Um, we have uh, an annual workshop, which will be in its uh, seventh uh, session in, uh, in May. Uh, that's public like this, so people are welcome to come. There, there's a selection of our latest research. It's just not, not just football that we do. We, the top paper there is horse racing. Um, the Premier League is the second one, but we have boxing as well. We have... Rugby is the paper in the Scottish Journal, the political economy for fans of the old Heineken Cup and some broadcasting at the bottom. And I also have a, an edited book coming out this summer. Um, it's got 26 or 27 academics from across the world, seven or eight different countries, three continents, a variety of sports. There's even GAA in there as well um, for, for, for fans of our, our native um, football. But um, yeah, I'm happy to take any questions and, and thanks very much. Uh, your attention. I hope you found that uh, engaging.